All right, shall we move on to the next topic uh, of the um, Anusatis? And now we come to the Chaga, Chaga Anusati. This is the recollection of one's generosity. And uh, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own generosity. Uh, Chaga in Pali. We have a monk called Chaga at Bodhinada Monastery. And uh, is he generous? Uh, yeah, he's good. He's pretty generous. Uh. So you have to, this is the nice thing about having a Pali name. You have to live up to your Pali name. Yeah? So if you are really stingy, you call you, we call you Chaga. And then you have to kind of, <laughs> the pressure is on to kind of change your habits. Uh. And uh, if you are, yeah. So um, this is how it starts out. Yeah? Uh, you recollect your own generosity. I am so fortunate, so very fortunate. Uh, that's kind of a nice way to start, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and then it says, among people full of the stain of stinginess, I live at home rid of stinginess. And that's, this is kind of a beautiful, this, I, I really like this because uh, this is uh, so different from how people normally think about things. Uh, yeah, you, um, so people, Many people in the world are probably stingy. Yeah, it's probably common to look after yourself and make sure that, no, you know, these are my things, keep your hands off my stuff, you know, don't, or whatever. We tend to be a bit uh, stingy because uh, we are attached to our property. Yeah, and that's why stinginess arises in the world. Uh, and uh, then if you are generous, you actually understand the power of generosity. Yeah, and because you understand the power of generosity, you see the stingy people in the world and you feel so happy that you're not stingy. You feel, wow, look at all the stingy people. Look how, how much suffering it is to be stingy. Yeah? How bad it is to be stingy. And I'm not. Wow, I'm so fortunate. So very fortunate. Yeah? And it's not that you feel better. It's not that you look down upon the others. It's just that you understand the power of these things. Yeah? So you feel really uh, uplifted from the fact that you have understood the power of generosity. Yeah? This is really... Um, it's just kind of one of those um, uh, um, remarkable things. Yeah, I don't think any, I've never seen this kind of phrasing before anyone else. Uh, and so it's like a simple phrasing, but actually very, very powerful. Uh, the understanding how fortunate you are to be able to have understood the power of generosity. Uh, wow, I'm so lucky. I'm generous. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Uh, all these other people, well, I feel really sorry for them. They don't understand the power of generosity. Uh, how come they don't understand? It's so obvious. You give and you feel happy. When you give, the main purpose who is the most lucky, the, per the person who gets the most out of it is the person who gives. Don't they understand that? And it's a beautiful thing about the spiritual qualities in the world. When you do something spiritual, it is good for the other person, also good for you. Yeah, so generosity is good for the recipient, even better for the giver. When you're kind and you live virtuous life, like before, you have sila, it's good for the people who are the recipient of your kindness, uh, but also good for you. Huh? This is how you can define a spiritual action. Uh, it is good for both parties, both the, uh, the other person, also for yourself. Uh. So this is, I don't know, this is kind of really, really nice. So let's, let's carry on and see what it has to say more about the idea of generosity. Uh. So you are freely generous. Uh, yeah, uh, Mutta chaga. Open-handed, or maybe it's yeah, I'm sure if, I think it's Mutta Chaga. Open-handed, uh, or something with Hatta, loving to let go. Yeah, Vusaga Rato, Vusaga Rato, committed to charity. Can't remember what that is. Uh, loving to give and to share. So, <laughs> so this is the idea of uh, being uh, being generous. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, some people are like this. They are just incredibly generous and they kind of give and give and give. And uh, why? Well, because they get so much out of it. Uh, there's so much happiness that comes from that. Uh, in fact, one of the qualities of uh, you know, being a stream mentor or being someone who attains deep samadhi is that you have to be fully generous. Uh, you can't hold back anything. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the ways that you know that someone has practiced a long way on the path. They are very generous people. Uh, they're always giving of themselves. If you ask something, they will say yes, unless they are so exhausted they can't do it anymore. They just need to recharge the batteries a little bit. But in general, generally, they will always give because giving is beautiful. 
And uh, especially if you're a monastic, you don't really want to hold on to anything in the world, uh, except for maybe your computer. Just to don't, don't look there. <laughs> so you don't hold on to many things. Yes, yeah, so there's nothing. Why should you not share everything you have? Because there's nothing really to have hold on to anyway. So it's kind of nice. Uh, so uh, this is the idea of generosity. And the, high, the more developed you are on the spiritual path, the more generous you will tend to be here. Uh, and that generosity can come out in many ways, but in, as a kind of general aspect, the idea of just giving in one way or, no, or another. Yeah. So, um, vosagga rato, yeah, delighting in vosagga. Vosagga is like uh, letting go or giving up. It is related to the word patinisagga, basically the same word, a slightly different prefix, that's all. Yeah. And patinisagga, you saw that before, uh, at the very end of the Anapanasati Sutta, we're talking about the, uh, at the very last, the contemplation of Vosagga, um, uh, Patinisagga, uh, Anupasi. Anupasi, right? Uh, yeah, Patinisagga Anupasi. So, the con the, in other words, the uh, contemplation of uh, letting go. Uh, and it's the same thing that you're seeing here. Uh, and when you go to the uh, f uh, five Indriyas, the uh, five spiritual faculties, uh, the indriya or the faculty of uh, samadhi is called uh, vosagga ramanankaritva samadhi labati chittasa ekagata labati. Uh, do you understand that? No? <laughs> it's, pa it's Pali, yeah? This is kind of basic Pali, yeah? So this is uh, so vosag vosagga ramanankaritva, vosagga is letting go. A ramana is like a foundational basis. In the Abhidhamma, it's often called a, the object of meditation, but in the suttas, it means a foundation. Karitva, having made, having made a foundation through letting go. Or Sangadamma Gitva, Samadhi Labhati, he gains Samadhi. Yeah, Chittasa Ikagata Labhati, he gains one pointedness of the mind. And uh, so there you find it again, yeah, the idea of letting go or giving up. And uh, so, uh, and this is one of those very interesting things. And you, the other thing you have here is freely generous, uh, uh, mutta chaga. Chaga, yeah, is letting go or, or giving up as well. Mutta is freedom, liberate. That's why it's freely here. Uh, and one of the things that I always like to point out to people, which is kind of fascinating, uh, and I've said it here before, but I will say it again, uh, <laughs> like so many things. Uh, mutta, chaga, vosaga. If you go to the third noble truth, yeah, of the three noble, four noble truths, uh, what does it have there? It has the four ways of letting go, as Adam Brahm calls it. What are they? They are uh, chaga, patinisagga, uh, mutti, yeah, yeah, and analayo, or analaya, four. So the last one, analayo, is not found here, but the other three are found here with generosity. Same thing as the third noble truth. The only difference is one is vasagga, one is patinisagga, but they have roughly the same meaning anyway. And that's kind of really extraordinary. Uh, and what you see there is that the idea, the movement of the mind that is generous uh, is a similar kind of movement of the mind that lets go of all suffering on the third noble truth. Uh, because it's all about letting go. Uh, except that when you are generous, it's a kind of a small letting go. And when you come to the third noble truth, well, that's kind of the final letting go, the ultimate letting go. Uh, but the movement of the mind is the same uh, because you're letting go of something that is yours. Uh, yeah, everything, all letting go is letting go of something that is yours. Generosity is about here, have my coffee. Actually, not, oh, not sure now. My mind is wavering. <laughs> it's trying to give, but actually not but holding on a little bit. And uh, so it's the same movement of the mind. Yeah, you are kind of giving up something that is yours. And that, it, when that becomes complete and fulfilled, that is when you have the third noble truth, yeah, the ending of all craving. Everything is given up. You understand that all attachment to the five khandas is, is bad. So you can see here why generosity is so powerful, right? It's a very kind of interesting idea that it is the same direction of movement as the third noble truth itself. So please be generous. Yeah, don't. You know, don't be too generous. Make sure you can survive, yeah? <laughs> because sometimes, they, actually in the suit, as you find people were so generous that they couldn't even live properly. They couldn't feed their children after a while. That's a bad idea. So please make sure you can feed your children. Otherwise, you know, your children are not going to be too happy with you. <laughs> so look after yourself, but uh, remember the power of these things, yeah? These are very, very powerful ideas. 
And this is why, I think, one reason why the idea of generosity is uh, so, uh, so much talked about in Buddhism and so often mentioned in the suttas, because it has this power, this kind of moving the mind in that same direction of letting go and ultimately achieving, awakening itself. Uh, so this is uh, generosity, yeah, so be, uh, and uh, then when you think about on your generosity, uh, then you will feel really joyful, uh, yeah, joy comes with these things. Uh, so when you are generous, uh, be generous where you feel inspired, uh, where you feel that your mind kind of inclines automatically, uh, where you feel compassion, uh, where you feel drawn towards giving. Whenever you feel drawn towards giving, give. Don't hold back. Don't be cynical. Don't think that, yeah, they will just misuse the money. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, the more, if you are cynical, then that destroys the whole act of generosity. Not every time you give, maybe not every time you give is going to be used for a good purpose. Yeah, okay, you give to a beggar in India. A little bit uncertain what's going to happen with that money sometimes. But uh, don't be too cynical about that. The majority of the time, what you give will be go for a good cause. Occasionally, it may not reach the right person, but only very occasionally. The majority of people in the world are good people. Uh, I heard something remarkable just, uh, I think, when was it? Just yesterday or something. I, and uh, this, it was a, a test that was done. This was done in Germany. Yeah? And as long as I read things that have to do with kindness and this kind of thing, because I think it's really interesting to see what kind of research also exists in these areas. It opens up your eyes to new things. Uh, and this was a research, we often, we tend to be very skeptical about other people. Yeah, those people of other religions, they're probably dodgy, yeah? Because that's why they're not Buddhist, so they must be dodgy. Yeah? But actually, probably not, yeah? Just because you are Christian or a Muslim, probably yeah? you're just as kind as Buddhist. Actually, there probably is no difference. If you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, you're probably still a very kind person just because you haven't got a religion. I didn't have a religion before I was Buddhist. I was one of those terrible atheists before I became a Buddhist. Yeah, Actually, I was a pretty good atheist because I still believed in kindness. And so just because, you know, we tend to kind of look at people who are different from us as somehow not as good or not living up to the same standards. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in politics, people get divided. With religion, we get divided. With views in general, we divide each other up. Uh, but actually, almost all people in the world, uh, almost everyone, is honest uh, and trustworthy. And this was an experiment that was done in Germany. Yeah? And in Germany, they had this experiment, and they, they said that, well, uh, if you... Uh, they, they, they called people up on the telephone, yeah? so they had no idea what the person was doing at the other, in the telephone. And they said to the person, said, well, now you, I want you to cost a toy, yeah? and if the toy lands on tails, we will give you a prize. <laughs> it sounds too good to be true, right? So I toss the coin, and if it becomes tails, then I get the prize. But the person on the other end of the phone, they have no idea what you are doing, right? You cost the toy, it's only you who know. You're the only one who knows. And so you would think maybe everyone gets tails, yeah, because everyone, you don't have any reason to tell the truth, yeah, because no one knows that you're lying anyway. But it turns out that everyone, over 50% of the people, got heads, yeah, even though they, everyone could lie if they wanted to, but obviously no one was lying, yeah. If they actually got heads, they told them they got heads. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? Yeah, here is a free prize you can get. No one will ever know if you lie because you're tossing that coin for yourself at the other end of the telephone and you can tell them whatever you want, but everyone was obviously being honest. Isn't that kind of nice? And so what that means is that, generally speaking, people are honest in the world. Yeah, People do the right kind of thing. So sometimes we are cynical for no reason. And that cynicism is actually very destructive and very bad. Okay, true, in India sometimes you find this kind of groups of people and then they may actually take advantage of you. Of course, occasionally it does happen. So you are circumspect. You try to do the right thing. But generally speaking, we have the kind of the right attitude towards these things. And then it becomes much more powerful. So, but as a general principle, when you feel inspired, when you feel that you, know, you want to give, you feel the mind is becoming peaceful, the mind is inclining in the right way, in all of those cases, that is the right time to give. And uh, as I said before, don't be too calculating about it. Uh, 
It is not about where there is most merit, because you don't really know anyway who is an arahant. Yeah? You have no idea what's going on. So don't worry too much about where there's most merit. Worry about how you feel about the situation. That is the right time to give. Whether it's a Buddhist cause or not a Buddhist cause, that, even that is not so important. Then you are on the right track. Yeah? And uh, what happens, of course, is that when you give like that, uh, when you give and you feel inspired, uh, well then when you give, you feel mindfulness is quite strong, yeah, because you are inspired. Uh, and because mindfulness is strong and you are inspired, good feelings arise when you do that. Uh, and because the good feelings arise and the mindfulness is strong, in the future, when you do the Chaga Nusati, it's easy to recall her. Uh, and it's happy to recall her. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of how this whole thing actually then works as a consequence. Mm. So this is the uh, idea behind this. Uh, so uh, Chaga Nusati. Uh, Let's go on. So when the noble disciple recollects their own generosity, their mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion, or desire, ill will, and uh, confusion. Uh, this is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of generosity. Uh, so in your meditation, yeah, you meditate happily away, you are kind of calming down, you can maybe, uh, but you find that your mind is a bit dull or whatever, it doesn't have that power or energy, and then you bring back to mind, yeah, you can bring back uh, in this particular event that you remember when you were kind, or you can bring back the general idea of generosity and why generosity matters, etc., uh, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera. and then just that simple perception, yeah, bringing that up can be enough to then uh, 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 generate some brightness and uh, and uh, energy in the mind. Uh, so, that is generosity. There's much more to be said about generosity, but uh, not this time, because uh, there is other things to be done. So... Uh, Okay, let's go on to the last one of the six recollections. A noble disciple <coughs> recollects the deities. There are the gods of the four great kings. The, um, yeah. the gods of the 33. The gods of Yama, the joyful gods the gods who love to create, the gods who control the creation of others, the gods of Brahma's host, the gods even higher than these. Yes, these are God, variety of gods. And uh, God, what are gods? Gods are just like glorified human beings. They're just like you, basically, except that they have a bit more happy, a bit more power, but you are also a kind of a potential god. So, uh, this is the meaning of gods in, uh, in Buddhism. And um, when these deities passed away from here, they will re be reborn there because of their faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. I, too, have the same kind of faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. When a noble disciple recollects the faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom of both themselves and the deities, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion, etc. And then it kind of moves on from there. Yeah. So this is a, a, a interesting kind of a way of contemplating. And I don't know if this makes any sense to you. Uh, some, you know, modern people sometimes think the idea of gods, etc., is a bit strange. But uh, remember what gods actually are. Gods are just beings, just like you, except that they are a bit more happy, they're a bit more powerful, their bodies are more light and bright, their minds are more beautiful, they have developed all these good qualities. 
but essentially they're just like uh, just like us. Yeah, they have their desires. They, they live in the world in their own way. Uh, and there is no fundamental difference between us and the gods, uh, and that kind of makes it more easy to understand what they are. But their rebirth is the result of good karma, and that's why they have all of these good uh, things happening to them. Yeah, so you can imagine the gods in your mind's eye. Uh, you can kind of feel what they look like, yeah, bright, beautiful, self-luminous, full of good qualities, yeah, very generous probably, very kind, because otherwise you won't get reborn in these things. Uh, so you see this kind of beings where the external appearance reflects the inner qualities. Uh, yeah, if you see someone, that's why we wear white, yeah. It's nice to see many of you actually wear white, it's kind of nice, yeah. Congratulations. Uh, because it's nice when you wear white. It's kind of, there's a degree of purity to that. Yeah? When I was in Sri Lanka recently, I gave a talk at one of the large centers in Colombo. That's called the BMICH Center. It's this large convention center. Huh? And I don't know how many people came to my talk. It's hard to say. It wasn't entirely full. I was a bit disappointed when it wasn't full. But anyway, <laughs> it wasn't entirely full. There were, but maybe, there were probably several hundred people there. I don't know if it was as many as a thousand, but several hundred anyway. And everyone wears white. Yeah? Every single person wears white. Uh, because it was the Poya day, the Apostata day, the full moon day or whatever. And it's very, it's very beautiful. Yeah? And everyone comes together. Uh, I'm the only one who is a bit dirty. Everyone else is kind of nice and pure. Huh? <laughs> everyone comes together. And then we listen to Dhamma talk. And we do a bit of puja, a bit of meditation together. Huh? And it's very, uh, it's very beautiful. And it kind of reflects the deities, because the deities are like that, yeah? They are pure. Their external appearance is bright and white and pure in the same way. Yeah? And so when you think about the deities, they reflect the inner qualities in their external appearance in this way. Yeah? And so when you see these deities, yeah, it is uplifting, yeah? yeah? Because there's something very beautiful about this. Yeah? And you are practicing probably the same way. I don't know exactly what you're doing, but hopefully you're practicing that way, yeah? You have the same qualities. And so you are kind of, you have some of those inner qualities, yeah, that the devas have. And that's kind of beautiful, isn't it? You see those devas, you think, yeah, I'm kind of heading in that direction. And that's great. And so you can choo choose your devas. I don't know which devas you, you prefer. Uh, I would recommend the higher ones. The higher, the better usually. But if you, you know, it's up to you. And if you don't reach the high ones, you reach some of the lower ones instead. Uh, so uh, these are the variety of devas. The higher you go, the more pure, uh, the more purity you need to get reborn there. And so the qualities that are required are the following. Faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. Uh, that gives an idea of what you have to do to achieve and to kind of move in that direction. Uh, yeah, ethics is kind of... Um, we know what that is. We've just been looking at that. Learning. Learning here means understanding the suttas, basically. Understanding the Dhamma. Understanding the teaching of the Buddha. Generosity is obvious. Faith is confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. So that is uh, something that grows gradually. And uh, wisdom here is uh, wisdom in a kind of broad sense uh, yeah, of uh, understanding. Impermanence, for example, is a kind of wisdom. Uh, and we have been talking about this quite a lot uh, during this retreat. Uh, and that is the foundation for that wisdom. Uh, the arising and passing away of things uh, is usually how it is uh, rendered in the suttas. And of course, arising and passing away is precisely about impermanence. Uh, so you know that you have those qualities uh, and then uh, you can rejoice in that. Uh, yeah. So uh, remembering the, the deities. Uh, So, uh, when you remember this, your mind is not full of uh, desire, ill will, or confusion because you, uh, uh, because you are focusing on spiritual qualities, uh, as always. Uh, at that time, the mind is unswerving, based on the deities. Uh, a noble disciple whose mind is straight or unswerving uh, finds inspiration in the meaning, the atta and the teaching, the dhamma, finds joy connected with the teaching. Uh, when the joyful rapture springs up, uh, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. Uh, body here means both the mental body and the physical body. Uh, and when you're blissful, the mind becomes stilled in samadhi. Uh, this is how samadhi arises, based on joy. This is why joy is so incredibly important. Without it, there is no attainment of samadhi. So we need to get that joy 
built up somehow uh, within us. So. This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the deities. When a noble disciple has reached a fruit and understood the instructions, this is the kind of meditation they frequently practice. Well, this is how they frequently abide. The Pali doesn't actually say meditation, but the Pali just says that they often abide like this. So this is a general thing that you can do. You don't have to sit down and cross your legs. You can do this pretty much at any time. Yeah, this is the nice thing about this. So, here you are. Let's do a little bit, let's do some more meditation together. <clears throat> okay, so any yeah. comments or questions, anyone there? Yeah. Yeah, good morning, Anton. Good morning. Um, can you explain a bit more about stinginess? Because uh -huh. I'm having trouble understand Vanna Micharyam. Vanna Micharyam. They got the five stinginess. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Vanna Micharyam. Ah, uh, Vanna Micharyam. Uh, Vanna Micharyam. Okay, so Vanna is uh, stinginess regarding Vanna. That's a good question. What does that mean? Uh, vanna. Usually vanna means like color or beauty or something like that. Uh, so what does it mean? Let's let me, I think what I will have to do is to, um, to just let me just look it up, see if I can uh, can find it. Is it, let's see if it is, um, because um, vanna macharya, there's different kinds of macharya, different kinds of stinginess, and they are grouped according to uh, um, Charya. So uh, let's see here. So these are some of the um, research tools that you can use to kind of search for things. Uh, this is kind of handy. So we have, let's see, we have Kula Macharya, which is stinginess regarding uh, families. Uh, that is kind of when you, if you're a monk or a nun, you don't kind of share the people who support you with others. You kind of, this is my support, just keep your hands off my supporters or whatever. You have Dhamma Macharya, there's a stinginess regarding Dhamma, that's a very bad idea. Yeah, you only kind of teach some Dhamma, not everything, and you kind of hold it back. Uh, here we have Vanna Macharya, right. Uh, Lava Macharya is kind of obvious. So this, here we have Vanna Macharya. So let's have a quick look and see how, what this is, uh, how this is mentioned here. Uh, um, regarding Vanna Macharya. Okay. So I don't know what that means. I, you know, this is kind of, um, I probably should know, but I don't know. And so what I will do, I will look up the commentary, see what the commentary says. That's kind of always the... Uh, the trick you see, and then when they get the commentarial explanation, it is not even, there is no commentarial explanations, that's kind of bad news. So uh, I, so hold, so stay with me briefly, we'll see whether we can find a commentarial explanation. Kula Macharya, Vanna Macharya, so here we are. Sarira Vanna, Guna Vanna, Vidita so it is the, the uh, qualities of the body, or the quality, or the, um, uh, the qualities of the person or the uh, beauty of the body. So uh, you are you are stingy regarding the qualities of the or the color of the body or, or the quality of the the qualities of the person. Hmm. So how do, how how does that work? Yeah. Racial discrimination. Racial discrimination. Uh, now because this is this is stinginess, right? Uh, so I'm not sure if that really works as discrimination, or, may, or does it? Maybe so you kind of treat some people in one way and other people in other ways. That what you mean? Yeah. And maybe that's what it means because Indians too they had a, some you know they had lots of different skin colors and and the the, pe the people 
it's cast, but the cast is based on, on, on skin color, right? It's a similar kind of thing here. Yeah? And if the darker your skin was, the worse it was and in India too. Huh? It was always like that. Uh. So maybe it's something like that. Uh. But the macharya usually means stinginess. It means you hold back. It means that you are... Uh, um, so that's a little bit... It doesn't quite fit with the usual understanding of this. Uh. Yeah. So, yeah. So that now you have asked me a question that I've never really considered before. It's very rare. I get a question I've never heard before. This is one of those I haven't heard before. So... Uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so I'm afraid that's. I'm afraid I don't really have a final answer for that one. So you, you're going to have to keep on investigating and see <laughs> see what you find out. Uh, yeah, but generally speaking, stinginess is bad, regardless regardless of where it is found, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Happy morning, Anjan. Happy morning. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, in yes. Diamond Sutra, the Mahayana Sutra, mm. um, I want to know what is your, what is the concept behind when they say those people who know Mandarin, they call it Wu Xiang Bu Si. I mean, no uh, form uh, in no, dana, in no, generosity. No what? No form. No form? Um, uh -huh. No receiver, no giver. No when you, oh, okay. yeah. when you yeah. donate yeah. Yeah. your time, your energy, yeah. your loving kindness, your laughter, your jokes, there is no people who are donating and no people who are receiving. Right. Uh, found in Diamond Sutra. Okay. Uh, what is your comment on this? Based on what concept? Yeah, uh, probably it sounds like it's based on the concept of non-self. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. That there's no giver, no receiver, and uh, I guess the idea is that not to be proud about it or not to be conceited about it, uh, and you give because giving is good uh, rather than thinking about yourself or the or or the person involved. Uh, I think it's probably something something like that. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the idea. So it's phrased in a slightly poetic and flowery language to make it more interesting, perhaps make it more poetic. Yeah. And this is uh, one of the things about uh, a lot of the Mahayana is often phrased in ways that is more, uh, more flowery and more kind of exciting. Uh, Theravada is often very down to earth. Yeah, it's like boring. Oh, okay, can't, you know, can't read any more of the Theravada suttas. So give me some Mahayana suttas now, please. I remember reading the Prajna uh, Paramita Sutta. There's, there's many versions of it. Uh, they have kind of the... Uh, the, yeah, the, the wisdom suttas in Mahayana, and as they start off, they have about 10 pages about all the bodhisattvas and about all the kind of Buddhas and all, and all this kind of things. So it is a very, straight away, you get the uh, feeling that you are entering a different kind of literature. It is very different from the early suttas where they don't have this kind of things. The early sutta just says the Buddha was in Savati, that's it, and then the other, these other suttas really go on forever. So that's kind of their, their language is different uh, and more, maybe more. Um, evocative and inspirational than going directly to the point in a sense. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Hi, Jerry. Yep. Uh, just wondering, right, why the Tusita Devas, why are they below the gods who love to create and the gods who control the creation of others? Because I would think like uh, the Saka, the Gamins, they have like their ill will and sensual desire weakened. Mm. So I would think they have a higher rebirth than Mara. So why is that so? Um, there are, I think it's just, you know, the problem is that the word like contentment has a large number of degrees. So these are the contented devas, Tusita is like san, Santuti and contentment. It comes in a large number of degrees. And when you look at the... Um, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path and the gradual training, contentment usually comes uh, just before sense restraint. Uh, yeah? So it is a fairly early on the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and that will often reflect the degree of contentment that is meant also in the case of rebirth. Uh, so when I talk about contentment and the Noble Eightfold Path, it means that first of all, you are virtuous. You know, you have the virtue of the body and the virtue of speech. Uh, then you are contented like the bird that flies off with its wings as only bird and that kind of contentment. Uh, and the idea there is simply that you are, you don't, you know, you, know, you um, uh, uh, that is the foundation for not craving too much. It's the foundation for not having any ill will. So then sensory strength come afterwards. Uh, 
if you're not content, well, you always have craving and ill will, and so censorship becomes very, very difficult. Uh, so the preliminary degree of con contentment happens fairly early on. Uh, you are a monk, and you're happy with your requisites. You don't want anything better, anything more than that, what you have. Uh, and so I think because that is where contentment is in the gradual training, I think it is not the higher kind of contentment that you know, goes all the way to, towards samadhi or whatever. It's a fairly preliminary stage. That's why I think it is where it is. Where it is uh, is that what you were asking? Huh? No. Because <laughs> well, we have like this yeah. impression like Mara, like he's evil. Yeah. And is it true that uh, the devas born in that realm, are they all that evil? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Mara is called the Papima in the suit of Papima. It means like the bad one or the evil one. Huh? But uh, I, you, you wonder what exactly does it mean in this particular context. I think the problem often also is the English word evil. It sounds very bad. But papa in Pali just means bad. Bad conduct is, you know, is a pa papa or whatever. So it doesn't necessarily mean kind of evil or supremely corrupted. So it is relative to what they're trying to do. So one of the things about them, they often said they want to bind beings to samsaric existence. They don't want beings to be liberated. So in that sense, they are evil, papa. But it doesn't mean that they are kind of malicious or angry or anything like that. It just means that they want to exert a bit of power or something. So, so it's a, the, the word papa is, very, is, is also relative. All of these words are relative, depending on the, on the circumstances. So I think uh, a lot of the Maras are probably kind of probably fairly nice, nice Maras. Yeah, they're probably not so, not so bad. They're probably... <laughs> fairly reasonable, except that they have some wrong views and wrong ideas about how the world works. Uh, even the Brahmas have wrong views. Yeah? They have this idea that they are uh, going to live forever, or that they are all-powerful, or they created the universe, or whatever it is that they think. Yeah? So all of these beings have wrong views. Uh, and so it's probably just a kind of wrong view, I would say, at the end of the day. So I think the Maharajas are probably not so bad. I mean, if you get reborn in that realm, in the realm of gods who, create, who control the creations of others, uh, don't hang out with the Maharas, of course, hang out with the other, other deities, yeah? Because I think that realm has kind of one corner, the Maharas, and the other corner is other, other kind of deities, and not, not all Maharas in that realm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, something like that. Uh, Ajahn, very yeah. happy to report. I used Nobu to ask that question, what are the different types of stinginess mm -hmm. in Buddhism? What and he gave me several you, types. What did you use? Uh, Nobu. Nobu. Nobu dash A. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I asked simple question. What are the different types of stinginess in mm. Buddhism? And he gave me five. Mm. Uh, Amisam, Macharya, uh, that stinginess of material resource, stinginess of knowledge, mm. stinginess of time energy, that's Kama, Macharya, mm. stinginess of uh, space and abode. And the, the last one was the one they were looking for. Stinginess with praise and recognition, Vana ah, Macharya. Of course, of course. Yeah. And it yeah, even yeah. gave me a, 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 a sutra, yeah. An, An, Anguttara Nikaya 5.254. Yeah, I already looked that sutra up. But the sutra just gives the list. It doesn't say what it means. Yeah, but of course, Vana means praise. That's what it means. Yeah, of course, it means praise in this particular context. Uh, it's got nothing to do with... Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of status, anything like that. Uh, so it is stinginess with praise. It right? makes very good sense, yeah. I should have, uh, I should have known that, uh, but... Um, the robot knew uh, better, yeah. 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 <laughs> So again? No, the robot no, 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 was the yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah. So I'm always a bit skeptical about it, but skeptical about artificial intelligence, because uh, I don't think it's all that intelligent. It's just a statistical thing. It brings together, it doesn't really have any intelligence as such. But anyway, we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll call it AI for now. Huh? Yeah. Yes, please. Sir. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning, yeah. More on the uh, recollection of the gods or deva. Yes. Uh, I think for <clears throat> us to be able to recollect better, it would be good to understand <clears throat> more about the concept of deva or, or god yeah. in, the Buddhist, <clears throat> in the Buddhist concept. I ask people, I think, what, what is God or uh, this Deva? How do they look like? Uh, this some say just bright light and all that. I wonder <clears throat> how how do they look like? First question. This uh, second question is why are there <clears throat> so few people who 
Hussein Deva. What Hussein Deva? Sir? Yeah, Hussein Deva. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, I read that somebody said that in Devas or gods like to be close to people who practice Dharma. Yeah. Uh, and I also heard uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi say in one of his talk that he stayed in Sri Lanka for a long time and in the place that is uh, full of juju. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's supposed to be a lot of Devas, but yeah. personally he has not seen one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think I heard of, a lot of people have seen ghosts. But very few people have seen, seen, seen the Deva. Yeah. So it's kind of strange. Strange, yeah, yeah. So what, why do people see, why is more ghosts more common than Devas? Uh, I think probably ghosts, ghosts are probably more needy. So they're probably hanging around human beings more. Yeah, they're around because they actually, this is why they are there, because they need our merit transfer, they need our, our metta and all of these kind of things. So they kind of hang around because of their neediness. Uh, and so I think ghosts are probably more likely to, to be around. That's probably why you, you see them more often. Uh, but uh, devas can also be seen. Yeah? And uh, I, I certainly know people who have seen devas, uh, and it's not that uncommon. Uh, I think one of the problems is that we don't know sometimes when something is a deva. Yeah? We don't know. We, we misunderstand. We think it's something else. Uh, and I think maybe some of these, uh, uh, what they now call the unexplained aerial phenomena, UAPs, it used to be called UFOs, now called the UAPs, apparently. I think these, some of these things may, may be devas, uh, yeah? because sometimes people just see lights, lights moving in kind of strange ways. What are these things? Uh, sometimes people talk about being, uh, uh, being abducted uh, yeah? by, 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 <laughs> by these, so they call it aliens, but maybe they're devas that abduct you. Uh, if, you read this, if you read the suttas, sometimes devas do strange things. Yeah? They go to an Ambasari Putta and they knock him on over the head or whatever. Uh, and so I think that uh, maybe we have much more connection with the devas than we think we have. We just don't understand what the phenomena is. Uh, and we call it uh, aliens, but actually maybe it's not all that alien at all. Maybe they belong to our realm. Uh, Maybe they belong to this reality in this world. Uh. And so uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I think that there is more, more connection probably than we think there is. Uh, what do they look like? Uh, and uh, I, but basically, the, I would say the form is uh, depending on what kind of deva it is. Some devas are just the light, they would be the higher devas. Uh, but the lower devas probably look a bit like us, uh, yeah, because when you extract the, uh, uh, the, uh, a mental body out of the physical body, uh, you come out with all your limbs and with your, all your faculties. Uh, and so you look like this, but the body you have is a fine material body. It is not a kind of a, a very, uh, it's not coarse like the human body. Uh, so I think they look large like us. Uh, and then you kind of head off to the, uh, the heavenly realms. Uh, but you are brighter, happier, more powerful. Uh, and uh, when you fight, you don't die. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the thing about the. Uh, uh, the, uh, this is kind of one of the things which also is a bit of a letdown with the devas. You shouldn't really kind of contemplate this when you contemplate the devas. Uh, but they, they, you know, their reality is actually in many ways very similar to the human reality. Uh, you fight, you have jealousies, you have children, you have all this kind of same kind of similar kind of problems as well. Uh, so there is that positive side and then there is the negative side uh, in the deva loka. So you can see it is like a continuation of human consciousness uh, because the thing they do and the way they think about the world is very parallel to how we think about the world and what we do. It is not actually all that separated at all from the, from the human realm. Uh, and uh, so that's how we can relate to it, I think, quite easily. You can very easily see yourself getting reborn there because basically it's just you getting reborn in a kind of slightly different way. Uh. Where do they live? They live in Devaloka. Yeah? What Devaloka is, uh, is, uh, <laughs> you, it's, it's right here. If you live well, it is right here. Yeah? So if you live well and have a good heart, and Devaloka is bang right here, right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, um, morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Um, I, I'm just, just wondering about your thoughts on um, volition of um, the donor and purity of the receiver. Um, mm. So um, I kind of find it surprising that, um, like, um, if you go to um, Dhammapada, um, the Sutta on Visali, you know, like, he gave the honeycomb if the 
uh, the merits were dedicated to me, then I'm happy to give you honeycomb. So even though it's for a good cause, it's for Buddha and Sangha, you know, mm. even if you're giving charity, it's for Buddha and Sangha. Mm. Uh, I always feel if you're giving that, okay, this will help me attain Nibbana or walk further on the path. Mm. I still kind of feel that that's kind of not really pure dana. Um, so, uh, but this was uh, obviously the Visali was, Sivali was uh, extremely praised and got so many rebirths in heaven and so on and so forth. So that kind of, um, it's bits, uh, it's kind of always kind of a bit surprising to me. Mm. One is that. And the second question I wanted was from your last comment so, so, on so, so, that you know. Say, say again, what did, what did Sivala say when he was giving? He, he, what was his intention? Sivali, he said that, yeah. uh, you know, because that was yeah. the last thing which was left. The honey uh, was lacking. Everything else was there. Yeah. Uh, so when uh, the one of the, they sent out people to search for that honey. Yeah. And one of the persons with a lot of money went there and he said, okay, so this guy has got honey. Can you give me this honeycomb? The peasant said, okay. So he was willing to pay fortune for it. Mm. And peasant said, why do you want to give so much of money for this? Sivali said, why do you want to give so much of money for this honeycomb? Mm. He says, this is the only requisite which is left for preparation of meal for Buddha and mm. Sangha. Mm. Uh, so I'm willing to prepare, uh, um, you know, give a fortune. And then the Sali, the peasant said, uh, I will not give it to you for any money. If mm. that is the amount of merit which is to be incurred mm. by giving this honeycomb, it's so much in, you know, uh, like so much required at the moment yeah. if you dedicate the merit of giving uh, this to me mm. i'm happy to give you honeycomb for free okay. um, and so it was given and it okay. was uh, used in preparation of meals as mm. the story goes in Dhammapada. Yeah. and after that it says that Vesali uh, Sivali i keep on saying Vesali Sivali he had um, a lot of rebirths in uh, and, uh, so, so Sivali was the one who gave the honey for free yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. but is, re is it really yeah. free? Because I want something, you know, the matter should be dedicated to me. And yeah. that has been received, that has <laughs> been actually in, uh, and as, as you said before, the mm. purity of the recipient. So I understand, obviously, mm. if you're giving mm. it to Arhant and Buddha and the Sangha, uh, the merit is more. Uh, but I mm. also feel um, that there's so many institutes and, you know, uh, the people actually, the Sangha actually mm. are well supported. Mm. But there are other people who are not so well supported and they not, may not be the ideal supatra mm. for dana. Mm. Uh, but, you know, like just because these people are not going to give me that much amount of merit, mm. so I'm not going to give it to them. I would rather give to highly yeah. accomplished monks yeah. rather than baby monks or uh, to other uh, lay people who are, yeah. you know, deprived. It just kind of doesn't sit right with me. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Um, and the okay. second let, question. Let me, let me start with that one before you go on to the second one because oh, okay. uh, let me <laughs> because it's a, it's a long one already. So just to kind of get get that to clear out of the way. And uh, yes, I think if you, uh, it, it's quite right that if you kind of think, may the merit be for me, like you did in that particular case or that story, it is not the ideal way of giving. Yeah, the ideal way of giving is you give, as someone mentioned here the other day, as a ornament for the mind uh, or a, or a requisite for the mind. You know that this is going to be good for awakening and for kind of leading the mind in the right way. And so, you know, through joy and all these kind of things. So you just give freely because that is the most beautiful way of giving. And we all know that, you know, that when you give freely, it's actually much more beautiful. It's kind of obvious. Yeah? You can see that in yourself. But if you have a kind of a greed connected with it, actually it does destroy the quality. Yeah? So that is, it is a little bit strange. But remember, it's a story from the Dhammapada Atakata, the Dhammapada commentary. This is not the word of the Buddha. A lot of those stories are really weird. A lot of the Jataka stories are barely Buddhist, you know? I mean, barely, like the, the most famous of all the Jataka stories, the Vesantara Jataka, is just dodgy. <laughs> yeah, the, the ethics of that sutta are really dodgy, and I don't know why in the Buddhist world we play these uh, uh, Jataka so much as if this is the Buddha's message, but actually it is not even, probably not even Buddhist in the first place. And so it's a good point, and that's why we should be very careful with some of these stories. And we should focus more on the word of the Buddha rather than these stories, because often they actually give the wrong message. So that is, uh, is, is absolutely true. And so, uh, yeah, so... Uh, so should one be guided by the fact that you're, you yeah. know, giving merit to, you know, you're giving dana to very accomplished monk, right? Uh, because yeah. you know, like yeah. this is going to give you more merit, which yeah. I see to some extent people justify, and I think even monks have justified it in some, you know, I, I actually yeah. doesn't sit right with me. So I well, just wonder what are your thoughts on it. Well, this is the thing. This is kind of where it comes in. What we're talking about before about where should you give, and what the Buddha says, where should you give. 
And he, the Buddha makes a distinction between where should you give and where is the most merit. These are two different questions. Uh, and you shouldn't necessarily give where there's most merit. You should give, the Buddha says specifically, where you are inspired. That's what you should give, where you feel compassion, where the mind is peaceful. Uh, so if you see that uh, someone is suffering and you want to give that, that's what you should give. You shouldn't then override that and, and calculate, okay, maybe this person is an arrow and I should give there instead. Uh, that becomes too calculating and too, too destructive. And anyway, you don't know who the arahants are, right? Maybe it's not an arahant. Maybe you get it completely wrong here. And so that is kind of a... So yes, no, I, I agree with you. But uh, it may be that you feel really inspired by the arahant, yeah? So, so maybe you share the giving. You give half to the arahant and half to the person who is uh, starving or maybe or, or whatever, depending on the circumstances. Uh, so, but if the arahant is really, really well fed, you probably don't feel very much like giving to them anyway, right? It's kind of, there's no need, they're already okay. So then you give to the poor person. So it is all about circumstances and, and all kind of things, uh, how, how that happens, uh, yeah. So, so we should definitely not be thinking about that, you know, we're making merit, just give it because yeah. of generosity, the feeling of giving, which gives yeah. so much of joy, yeah. we're just giving out, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, the yeah. idea of calculating the merit is always, uh, I think, a very dangerous thing to do, right? yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, one last question. <laughs> uh, yeah, John, uh, continuing from the brother's question, yeah. uh, maybe a repeat, maybe I've spoken this before. Just want you to elaborate uh, about when someone passes on, uh, whether they get reborn on the 49th day or the 100th day, or what's the. I think, I, think, yeah, I don't think there is any. Uh, any uh, kind of uh, standard number of days. Uh, I think the number of days will vary a lot. I think the 49-day thing is a thing you find in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and uh, there may be some truth to that. Maybe that is a kind of average or the usual or the or whatever. Uh, but, uh, but how quickly you get reborn will depend on a number of things. And some rebirths happen straight away, for example. If you have very powerful kamba, you just get reborn straight away. For example, if you have a if you have access to deep samadhi, yeah, then as you uh, practice, as you, as you die, you go enter that state of samadhi and you get reborn straight in the jhana realms as a consequence. Uh, yeah? So it happens kind of straight away here. Yeah. So in that kind of situation happens very, very, very quickly. But if your karma isn't quite that strong, yeah, then it may take a while. You may have to have the, you know, the recollection of the, your life and the kind of life review and all of these kind of things uh, before you actually kind of, you know, the... Uh, the the consequences ripen. So it, uh, so it will vary. Uh, so the, the nice thing about this is that you, regardless of uh, what you do, yeah, there will always be someone who benefits from your generosity anyway. So if you do something for the departed, uh, yeah, still there will always be someone there. So really what we should do, we should always do things for the departed, uh, regardless of whether someone has recently died or not, uh, because there will be someone who can benefit from those things. Uh, they will be very happy to see you uh, do something for them. They say, oh, wow, thank you for <laughs> helping out. Yeah? So it's always a, a supportive thing to do here. Yeah.